we're about to hear a performance, um, which is a, uh, a reading. Uh, the artist um, has uh, selected archive materials found in a fire. Uh, the artist is Rebecca Garado, and uh, the, the uh, person who is reading is uh, Gabrielle DeWitt, who will introduce the work. Thank you. Read to you an extract from the newly found diaries of Sir Merton Russell Holmes. 28th of February 1883. The past couple of days have been so hectic that it almost doesn't feel right to have time to sit and write my thoughts. It was three days ago when the information that a last minute booking had been made into our fully booked out hotel came to my understanding. I was ready to ask whoever had committed such an absurd act to pack up their belongings and quietly leave until I received the name of our soon-to-be guest, Oscar Wilde. He had heard through the grapevine about our magnificent hotel and was desperate, yes, desperate, to see it for himself. The pure notion of someone as important as Oscar Wilde occupying one of our rooms required a breather. There was so much to be done, as everything was to be perfect for an influential character such as himself. He comes from a very impressive background. His father was knighted around 20 years ago, and his mother is a very talented writer in her spare time. Therefore, the staff were ordered to immediately commence a series of tasks to ensure our hotel was spotless. We had all heard about how the son of a knighted <coughs> medic was a flamboyant dresser and had glittering conversation. But as he entered through the reception doors the following morning, he resembled a modern foreign artifact that I would have paid to include in my collection. At 30 odd years of age, his dark hair fell voluptuously over his shoulders. As the bellboy rushed over to collect his bags, I and myself strolled over to meet him. I introduced myself and stated what a delight it was to have him stay in our hotel. I bet it is, he responded, with a smirk which was only present in the life of pedigree aristocrats. Wilde knew the importance of his visit and the amount of attention it would attract, and thus his stay turned, his stay turned into an unpleasant game of satisfying him for a good review. I did all that was in my power to make him comfortable as he could be. His room overlooked the sea, but he would complain about how the sound of crashing waves against the pier disturbed him in the morning. The chambermaids chamber would come round and iron his clothes, who complained that they were not meant to be ironed, and would go on to recite some verses on something he names aestheticism. I had no other choice but to bribe him, but what could I offer to the man that had it all? Last night, whilst I stayed up late in the lobby, Wilde had been drinking in an area we call the Triangle, and was being carried in by two young men. <coughs> My plan fell straight into place. I knew his mannerisms were not solely because of his posh upbringing. He was a homosexual and it was just what I needed to achieve a good review. I have no problem with homosexuals. In fact, over my travels, I have seen so many different cultures that it was a shock there were not more around Great Britain. But I was not afraid of using this against him. My initial idea of bribing became blackmailing after the information I had gathered. Therefore, this morning, it was not the crashing of the waves against the pier that woke world up, but my knocking at his door. As he had the knock, he seemed hesitant to open the door for a couple of minutes. When he did, the smell of stale gentleman's cologne pervaded my nostrils. I told him that when he was decent, I would be waiting for him in my office for a chat. And I felt so much satisfaction watching his face turn to stone. When he arrived, he did not seem embarrassed, but almost proud. I started off by stating how our Bath Hotel was a reputable centre that many upper class civilians came to because they expected a certain behaviour accompanying it. He laughed. There's nothing upper class about this hotel. It's a photo album, a memory box of travels for you, for you and your special wife. But let me ask you this question, Martin. Where did all these belongings emerge from? How dare he question me in my own home? The thought of these words rolling off his tongue still make my blood boil. I responded with something much more aggressive along the lines of, now listen, you little faggots. You may have just left Oxford with an English verse prize. All that respect and admiration for both your fellow peers and the public will disappear if the news of your sexuality happen to emerge. So I suggest a mutually beneficial agreement. You write me a good review, 
and praised my palace in exchange for my sworn secrecy. I genuinely thought this was an excellent plan. There was nothing he could do. If he chose to ignore my agreement, he would face imprisonment. As I said, there is nothing upper class about you, he responded, with that wit he knew would anger me. As well as signed out of the Bath Hotel, my receptionist asked if he would like to include anything in the guest book. And I can't help but laugh when I say that as much as I despise that man, he has a gift for words. You have built and fitted up with the greatest beauty and elegance a palace and filled it with gems of art, he wrote.